Hello and welcome to Connected with Latham, where we discuss ideas, legal developments and business trends shaping the global economy. I'm Tom Evans, a private equity M&A partner in Latham and Watkins London office. In this episode, we discuss the rise of growth equity and how private equity and venture capital are connecting. I'm joined today by a fellow partner from the London office, Mike Turner. Mike's a member of our emerging companies practice and represents clients across the TMT sector. He focuses on software, consumer internet, traditional digital media, ad tech, fintech, and everything else with tech in front of it. Thank you for joining, Mike. Hey, Tom. Good to chat with you. I'm very keen to talk about the piece that you co-authored in Latham Watkins' PE Views titled The Rise of Growth Equity, Connecting PE and VC. I think it's fair to say that most emerging companies have historically been backed by venture capital funds. But as Europe's startup scene matures, are we seeing involvement by more traditional private equity investors? It's a good question, Tom. And what we've actually seen over the space of the last 12 to 24 months in particular is actually quite a dramatic change in the makeup of the funding community chasing these growth opportunities. The world of growth capital has really begun to emerge with a bunch of different players coming into the market. So we're seeing the more traditional venture capital funds raising new dedicated growth capital funds for later stage investing, often in the very same companies who they would otherwise be investing in at an earlier stage. We're seeing some very dedicated and specific growth capital players chasing the the scale-up opportunities, SoftBank Vision Fund probably being the most celebrated. And we're now also seeing the uh, private equity firms who have been engaged more traditionally in the leveraged buyout space, stepping down, if you like, into minority transactions, often in spaces within the tech sector that they haven't previously played in before, um, the consumer internet space being a really good example. And lastly, I suppose there's a a new uh, class of investor, the crossover investors doing the late stage private and over into the public transactions, a lot of hedge funds and the likes coming into that space as well. So I think all of a sudden, every, uh, every class of investor has got the joke about the value of the tech sector. So it's an interesting time to be in the market. And from a private equity perspective, uh, they're very used to doing controlled buyouts. How are you seeing them adapt to needing to come to terms with minority investments? Awkwardly, in many cases, as the investors get acclimatized to the very, very different type of space that the venture capital world looking up, if you like, provides to them. These financings are quite different. And they require some quite different thinking from the private equity uh, firms. They're stepping into a fairly light touch environment in terms of the um, control rights that they might have and some of the economic mechanics that they will get in these financings. And it requires some slightly different thinking but the, because the companies in which they're investing are typically very fast growth. And the bet that the the funds are taking, if you like, is on the continuing success of the company, the rapid growth of the company, as opposed to the fund necessarily buying into strong traditional revenue streams as they might otherwise be doing. And so when a private equity investor is looking at one of these deals, what are the key issues that they should then be focusing their attention on if they need to be pivoting to, to looking at other issues? The first is that the opportunities involve them still backing the founders, the management team. So getting particularly acclimatized to those founders and what those founders want and what they can do for the business, what assistance and support they need as they move into the next phase is certainly one critical element of it. The second critical element, it seems to me, is that the PE investors are often the first real grown-ups at the table, if you like, and they're coming in behind the more traditional venture capital investors. So if you like, they're bridging that gap between a very fast growth startup, which is probably still rather behind the curve with a lot of its compliance and so on, and is needing to become far more conformist 
as it moves into the next stage of its life, because frankly, the next stage, the next phase after the PE firm has come in is going to be some form of exit, maybe a capital market transaction or possibly an M&A transaction. So the PE firm is the proponent of making sure that the company is actually getting ready to do that. And so can I pick up uh, two particular issues with you, Mike? One is board control and the other one is, uh, is exit. So how should a private equity investor be thinking about um, board control and the opportunities that, that that offers as compared with the, the typical investment it makes where it has control? Some of the things the PE investor is going to need to think about is that it will in likelihood be lucky to get even one seat on the the board, perhaps with an observer right as well. The other institutional investors of note in the company's financing history may also have board seats as well. So there may be, by the time the PE fund comes in, three or four institutional investors on the board. And most likely beyond that, there will be a couple of founders. And if there's an external CEO, he or she might be on the board as well. And that's going to be the board. And typically what we're finding is that the board size needs to be contained so that the earliest stage investors, the seed investor lead or the series A investor lead, will drop off the board as the later stage financing comes along. But for the PE firm, they're likely to be one out of maybe six or seven on the board at that particular point still, whilst they will undoubtedly have particular director veto rights and investor director rights, they do tend to be limited. And then, Mike, in terms of, of exit, what, uh, what do you find our private equity clients are looking at? They're typically going to be looking at some form of control over the exit, but it's probably going to be a very limited form of control. We typically have what we call qualifying IPOs or qualifying M&A transaction protections, where there will be a hurdle uh, below which the PE firm might have to consent to the transaction. If, for example, it's below a particular multiple of its investment, that would depend on the stage at which it comes in and the likely runway to exit. So at one end of the spectrum, I've just closed a transaction where the exit hurdle is only 1.2x the uh, private equity investor's entry level price. So if the company goes public or exits in another way at a price which is at least 1.2x the value that the uh, private equity investor came in at, it cannot block the exit. Now, often you're going to see that multiple higher for obvious reasons. and There may be time-based hurdle as well or instead. That is the typical leverage that the investor is going to have. So it's not huge. They're really betting that the multiple is going to be a lot higher, of course, but they're not given the control rights other than at a fairly modest multiple level. Got it. And can I ask you about one particularly techy um, part of the, the exit world in, in, in growth capital, and that is participating and non-participating preferences on, on an exit. And I think this is an area where your typical venture and your typical private equity investor can be at, at loggerheads. But it'd be helpful for our listeners if you wouldn't mind just taking us through an explanation of those and where you see the market ending up. Thanks, Tom. The market has um, interestingly now become quite established and settled. These series investments, as we call them, tend to give the new series a one times non-participating liquidation preference over the amount that is being invested. In other words, it's a kind of a downside protection. It could possibly be at the top of the waterfall or it could possibly be set above all the other preference shareholders or more often it's going to participate alongside those preference shareholders. But basically give the preference shareholder the option as to whether to take its money back or to convert into ordinary shares and enjoy more, which is the only reason it would convert, of course. So it's effectively a downside protection, as I say. Um, it's not always the way it has been. Historically, we saw far more participating preferences where the investor would get its money back first and then participate. Uh, now, typically, it has the choice only on a non-participating basis. The only time we tend to see a request 
for a participating preference is where perhaps there's a real challenge over the valuation at which the particular fund is coming into the round. And I would say it's very rare these days to see a participating preference now. Thanks, Mike. Interesting discussion on the on the board and the exit rights. Is there anything else that um, typical private equity investors uh, should be looking out for uh, on these growth investment deals? Well, the ask that they make is often for economic terms, which give them more comfort in terms of the place that they're coming from, the history of their typical investments, as opposed to the place that they're going to in the context of these investments. So redemption rights might be a very good example. We do see redemption rights, but they're pretty rare. The ability to remove management and to change management is often a request um, because, again, I think it's fairly common in the private equity world, but very uncommon in the venture capital world, where the investors are typically being asked to back a particular founder or particular management team. The request to have founders revest a portion of their equity can quite often come from the private equity investor, but that's usually much later than we would expect to see it in the venture capital world. We would expect to see those requests stop after, say, a B round, and the expectation to be that the founders and the investors are going to have their interests uh, comfortably aligned at that point. The control rights, well, you know, private equity investors would like to have as many control rights over the operations of the business as possible, as well as over its corporate affairs, future fundraisings, and so on. But again, they're going to have to get used to probably taking less than they would otherwise ordinarily receive, particularly in later stage series financings. Understood. So it sounds like our view is that uh, terms are, uh, are starting to, to change as you get that meeting of the venture and the private equity um, capital minds, and that we think will continue into the, into the next 12, 18 months, Mike. Yes, indeed. And it's a mindset, really, that is flowing from the extraordinary growth that we're seeing in the, in the technology economy globally. We're seeing quite extraordinary outcomes in terms of the IPOs, the M&A outcomes. And of course, these days, with a lot of these companies that are de spacking into, uh, into SPACs, looking for a good target to acquire. Um, I think there's a growing understanding from these investors that they're climbing onto a horse which is already running pretty fast at that stage and that this is truly an exercise in leveraging some pretty extraordinary equity upside but probably with some slightly greater risks from the private equity firm than they would otherwise ordinarily feel comfortable taking. And you mentioned the word leverage. So my last question for this afternoon is to really ask, Mike, are you seeing um, uh, investors utilize leverage in making these, uh, these typically equity investments? Not really, Tom. No, there's very little leverage in these transactions. And the leverage that, that there is tends to be quite bespoke venture debt, which is a hybrid form of debt between traditional debt and equity. It's not uncommon for there to be a venture debt slice in these financings, but it needs to be thought through in probably a slightly different way. It has an equity component to it, of course, but it's certainly less dilutive than pure equity would otherwise be. But the uh, private equity firm bringing more traditional leverage itself to the transaction is very unusual. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, Mike. My great pleasure, Tom. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners for listening to this episode in our Connected with Latham podcast series. You can subscribe and listen to new and archived episodes of Latham's podcasts on LW.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. If you'd like more information about the topics in this podcast, please email us from links located in the show description. We hope you'll join us next time. This podcast is provided as a service of Latham & Watkins, LLP. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Latham & Watkins, LLP, and you should not send confidential information to Latham & Watkins, LLP. While we make every effort to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and current, we do not warrant or guarantee any of those things.
and you may not rely on this broadcast as a substitute for legal research and or consulting a qualified attorney. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for engaging a lawyer to advise you on your individual needs. Should you require legal advice on the issues covered in this podcast, please consult a qualified attorney. Under New York's Code of Professional Responsibility, portions of this communication contain attorney advertising. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each representation. Please direct all inquiries regarding the conduct of Latham & Watkins attorneys under the New York's disciplinary rules to Latham & Watkins, LLP, 885 3rd Avenue, New York, New York, 10022-4834, phone number 1212-906-1200.